Well, good evening. How you guys doing? My name is Sean. I'm one of the associate pastors here. Um, and it is my privilege this evening to bring the word of God. Um, you know, I used to be a campus minister, and that's still kind of <laughs> residuals of that. I love you, Mimi. Thank you. <laughs> um, this evening, we will be looking at Acts chapter 5, uh, verses 1 through 5, as well as um, Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. But we'll start in Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. But a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. When that Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard of it. Heavenly Father, we really need your help this evening. I pray, Father God, that you will use me as a tool to communicate your message. Um, that you will give us all ears to hear and that you will begin to inscribe on our hearts um, the lessons that you have for us this evening, those things that are from you. We wanted to, my prayer is that it will produce fruit in us a hundredfold. And so, Holy Spirit, I pray that you will take over, that you will move, and that you will have your way in the name of Jesus. Amen. May 22nd, close family member, um, my wife's nephew, was in a car accident. He was coming out of school. It was right after a track practice. It was raining really hard, and he was riding with a friend. So they get in the car, and, and they're kind of speeding off. You know how it is when you're a teenager. You like to drive a little bit faster, maybe, than the suggested speed limit. But because it was raining, the car began to hydroplane, and it flipped. The unfortunate thing was that my nephew did not have on his seatbelt. So he bangs his head up against the sunroof so hard that it pops out. And as the car rolls over, he eventually gets thrown from the car, and the car lands on top of him, pinning him down. I'm happy to say that by the grace of God, that, that God actually healed him. He had, he had a 95% a, a chance of dying. That God, that God brought him back from that, and, and though he has some physical ailments, we're believing that God's going to fully help him to recover. He finished the whole semester of college. Um, he's actually taking some summer school. Um, so God has helped him to recover. He, he ended up finishing his senior year in high school because it happened as he was a rising senior, and, he, and, he, and he's gone on to do some, some college and things of that nature. But the point th that I'm bringing up is that there was something that could have prevented the major injuries that he, he, he received. Because the driver who had his seatbelt on did not suffer the same injuries. In fact, kind of miraculously, he only had a couple of scratches, no broken bones or anything. While my nephew suffered great brain damage, skull, lack of usage of his arm. In no way am I trying to blame him. But there's something about something as small as a seatbelt that can prevent some of the most or the worst types of pain that you could ever imagine. Here as we look into this passage with Ananias, I believe that there was a seatbelt that he should have had on that he has seemed to remove that allowed him to breathe his last breath after talking to the Apostle Peter. And I believe that seatbelt was the fear of the Lord. I think that there was a lack of the fear of the Lord on him that he had drifted away from that did not allow him to have the reverential awe that we should all carry when we are standing before the king of kings. But similarly, 
We too can fall prey to it because it's just a mere man standing in front of you. I'm not anything special. And in no way do I put myself anywhere near the category of the apostle Peter. But he was a man. And Ananias saw a man. And him and his wife, they, they took what they had and they presented it as if they could get it by men and receive the applause that would come along with their good deed. To really be able to understand what's going on in the passage, we have to go back a little bit. Here we are in the book of Acts. Um, Luke is the writer, and he's really trying to depict what's going on with the church. After Christ has, has after recording in the gospel of Luke the, the life of Jesus, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, now he is accounting for kind of the start of the church and its movements, looking at partially with Peter, and then, then he primarily goes with Paul and, and recounts the acts that have taken place in his life as God was spreading the church. Here in, in chapter 5 is off of the heels of the day of Pentecost where the Holy Spirit has already come down. Peter has preached a, a hard word to the people telling them that they have killed our Savior. 3,000 are added to the church. Some tribulation begins to come in. There's some healings. There's some miraculous things that go on. And I would presume that Ananias knew everything that was going on, even if he didn't have the 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 wasn't blessed enough to really know about Jesus. I'm sure he heard rumors. He may not, may not have encountered him, but he, he certainly would have seen um, the healings. He would have seen or heard um, directly from John and, and Peter about what God was doing. So he would have had firsthand knowledge of how God was moving. But this is all on the heels of being under the type of legalistic leadership that the Pharisees provided for all of those who were in Jerusalem. It was a, a, a type of leadership that was imposed on them where you had to follow every letter of the law or you wasn't getting it right. I mean, think about it. There were, there were situations where Jesus, he heals a man and he's walking with his mat healed. And they cared more about him carrying a mat on the Sabbath day than the fact that the man was healed. This is the type of tyranny of leadership that Ananias sat under. And so he finds a new freedom, a new freedom of grace, the message of grace. We're saved by grace and by faith. He hears that message and it, he begins to throw off the constraints. How about you? You know, when I was a kid, I, I remember being in what was, you know, a holiness church, a Pentecostal church, and, and it, was, it was kind of interesting because women weren't, if you wore something above your knees, you wasn't the kind of woman <laughs> that wasn't thought too highly of. Makeup was a no-no. If you showed your shoulders, there was a problem. If you was a man and you wore a hat in church, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. what's going on here? There was a sense of legalism. There was the hellfire and brimstone kind of preaching that I remember as a kid hearing and being really deathly afraid of, of you know, being captured by this angry God who would cast me into hell. And unfortunately, I, I kind of strayed away from the church and, and, and come back. And, and, and just recently, I, I, I was um, talking with my wife, and, and we were talking about another family member, and, 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 and she said, She's 20 years old. She said that, you know, I, I, I can't, uh, you know, I used to fear God, but I want to have a relationship with him. And that's kind of the state that we are in. That's what's kind of culturally as Christians, that's where we are. We don't want the legalism of this hellfire and brimstone type of message. And we may just drift over into a space that says, I don't want the fear of God. So what happens when you don't have the fear of God? Similar to Adam and Eve and what took place in the garden, I believe there's some, some parallels that, that, that um, Ananias walked in, that Adam walked in. Because of the great relationship that they both held, I mean, Ananias had to know, man, Jesus, he died for us, he confirmed it. Maybe Ananias was one of the 500 that, that met Jesus from that perspective. He, he certainly would have heard that it was confirmed that he rose from the dead. And, it, and what kind of 
awe or, or what type of love does that engender for one to know that there was one who came and you lived in that time? Similar to Adam who walked in the cool of the day with the father. There was an an intimacy there. There was a love that was there. And being in that ditch of just love, I think Ananias, as he drifted away from having a reverential fear of the Lord, like Adam, he opened up a door so that the enemy could come in. Verse 3 of Acts 5 says, but Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? That drifting, that, that moving away, that going too far to the left allowed for him to be in a position so that the enemy could attack him. Similar to Adam. There was something that happened. I don't know if it was his his relationship with Eve or something that got him into a space that disobeying God became plausible to him. And here we are at the birth of the church, the enemy attacking the same way, the same way that he is attacking us today. That he wants to move you away from this reverential fear of the Lord saying that it doesn't take all of that. The God that you serve, he's, he's just love. You know, he, he, the past, present, future. Jesus is the propitiation for your sins. You know, God, he knows your heart. It's okay. He can slip in. I don't think it was malicious. I mean, think of this scenario with Ananias. People are being persecuted in that church. And if you, if you read at the end of chapter 4 of Acts, you find out that Barnabas had just sold some property and given it to people. And so there was this commonality among the church there um, that, that they gave to one another. It wasn't like, it, this is all mine. It was, man, if this is needed, I am willing to give it so that my brother can eat. There was some level of love. It wasn't a malicious thing. It wasn't um, that he was stealing from people. Actually, him and his wife had decided to sell property to help somebody who was hurting. So I don't think that he hated God or anything like that. I think he loved God, and he loved God's people. But just like my nephew, he didn't put his seatbelt on. He left the seatbelt off. It wasn't, it wasn't something intentional. He wasn't trying to be rebellious. But it was the enemy able to, to weasel his way in and, and, and begin to twist things up to him. That he would go, even go as far as talk to his wife and lead his wife to lie to the Holy Spirit. Whom he's supposed to love as himself. How could you lead your wife this way? It's removing of this seatbelt. It's, it's, it's a slight thing. It's, it's throwing off constraints. It's not thinking that it takes all of that. It's reading through your Bible, and when you get to a passage like this and it feels uncomfortable, instead of dealing with it and asking God for better clarity or seeking it out, we just move right along. Let me get back to the love. Maybe it's when you're in Proverbs, if you're reading your Bible every day, as Pastor Brett loves to say. That you're just kind of breezing by all of those references to the fear of the Lord. And you're just thinking about wisdom and how it's supposed to give me silver and gold. It's a slight thing. But it's something that we do because culturally, we don't like to think about things that are uncomfortable to us. I'm sure my nephew didn't think anything other than, I don't like the way it feels when I put this seatbelt on, if he thought about it at all. And so when the subject of the fear of the Lord comes up, we often run to our scriptures. Doesn't perfect love cast out fear? What are you you talking about, pastor? In fact, some of you may have wanted to shut me down or not even listen when you heard of the title. Because it makes me feel uncomfortable. But the thing is, is that when the enemy slips in and he begins to deceive you, being the father of all lies, God held Ananias responsible just like he will hold us responsible. Peter says to them, why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? 
So our unwillingness to put on our seatbelt does not put us in a position that God doesn't hold us responsible for our behavior. But once again, isn't fear, uh, isn't that not of God? Why would God want us to have fear of him? Actually, before I start to deal with why does he want us to have fear of him or what is the fear of the Lord is, is, is what I should have said. There was one other verse that I want to make sure that I point to is that when we're not putting on the seatbelt, Proverbs 129 says, because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. When we don't put that seatbelt on, then we are not choosing the fear of the Lord. And there comes grave consequences with that. And there in, in Proverbs chapter 1, where, where, where what, what the author is writing about is the fact that God will not come to the defense of people who in the moment of tragedy, in the, in the moment of, 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 of a great situation that has come, about, come upon them, he's not going to answer because they did not spend time with him beforehand. I know that doesn't sound good. I, I know that's not the kind of God that we would like to have um, answer our prayers. The kind of God that we create for ourselves is one who responds when I talk to him, and so be it. In fact, he's the kind of God that allows me to set the rules. That I don't really have to love him with all my heart, with all my mind, with all my soul. When we unbuckle this, the, the fear of the Lord, that's in essence what we begin to say through our behavior and our actions. Now, don't get it twisted. I'm not saying that there isn't grace. But there's a clear example that the Lord is making here. And we see the results of it. In verse 5, And when Ananias um, heard these words, he fell dead and breathed his last, and great fear came upon all who heard of it. There was, an, there was something that God was demonstrating. There was something about his holiness and his purity that he wanted to get across. Not just for them, but for us. And this is why Luke wrote what he wrote. Because it, he was inspired by the Holy Spirit. And so we have to hear this well. So what is the fear of the Lord? What is it that God brought upon them? Is it the, the kind of fear that, that has you um, um, just kind of trembling and not want to move? I, I, I remember when I was a kid, back in uh, like the early 90s, Mike Tyson was, was like the, the most feared man on the planet, at least the people I knew. <laughs> and, 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 and people would say like, hey man, would, for a million dollars, would you let Mike Tyson punch you? Oh man, man you crazy. There's a fear of him. Is, is, is that what God wants? Like, like he's a tyrant or something? And does he want us to cower in fear of him? No, that is the, a demonic fear. That is a demonic fear that comes from the pit of hell. Should we respect him? Should we have awe and reverence of him? Do we have an understanding that, that angels cover their faces? <laughs> they cover their feet in his presence. And cry out, holy, holy, holy in his presence. Do you remember Isaiah's response in, in Isaiah 6 that he said, whoa, whoa, whoa. I, I don't even want to talk because I'm a man of unclean lips. This is the type of fear. This is the type of reverence that we have for him. But it's not a cowering. It's not a, a, a one that comes from a tyrant. That's not what was brought upon these people. What is it? What is the, the, the fear of the Lord? What is this type of fear? The fear of the Lord can be defined as the continual awareness that our loving Heavenly Father is watching and evaluating everything we think, say, and do. The fear of the Lord can be defined as the continual awareness that our loving Heavenly Father is watching and evaluating everything we think, say, and do. This type of fear includes awe and reverence. It produces submission and submissiveness. 
This type of fear includes awe and reverence. It produces submission and submissiveness. In other words, this type of fear motivates us to seek how to please the Lord in all situations. It's like a child who loves their parents. And it's not so much a fear of punishment that that motivates them. It's a fear of disappointing them that motivates them in such a way that they look to please them. And they ask them questions and they're there and they're, how can I, what should I do? And they, they look to them for everything that they need. The fear of the Lord actually brings about intimacy with the Father. Because if we get too familiar with him, it could be a, a real problem when we're standing up, when we're standing close to a God who's an all-consuming fire. So it, 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 it is there as a, as a barrier. It's there as a, as a way of, of, of helping to produce in us the type of behavior that prevents lawlessness. See, I, 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 I may have said it earlier, I think there's like two ditches on this, on this narrow road that, that we're supposed to travel on. And one ditch is the legalism. And God said, no, there's grace. There's unmerited favor. You, you didn't deserve it, but you can't earn my love. You can't earn this relationship that I'm inviting you into, so I send my son to die for you. So there's, there's grace to keep us out of this ditch. But when we just presume upon grace and we just presume upon his love for us, there's the other ditch of legalism, excuse me, of lawlessness. And so the fear of the Lord helps us to stay away from the lawlessness. It helps keep us in a path that will be pleasing to him. Look what Jesus says about the fear of the Lord. It says in Matthew 10, 28, don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They cannot touch your soul. Fear only God who can destroy both soul and body in hell. So there should be some fear of God. It should motivate you to walk in holiness. First Peter 1 tells us that our motivation isn't just that he can kill body and soul, but that he... he he sent his only begotten son to die for us because of the blood. It should motivate us to walk in such a fashion that is obedient to him, to be holy because he's holy. Jesus himself submitted to um, the fear of the Lord. Isaiah chapter 11 verse 3 says, And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. Him prophesying about our Savior says that Jesus delighted in the fear of the Lord. This continual awareness that God is watching. Jesus, when working or, or uh, speaking with the Samaritan woman, tells his disciples that um, as they come back and, and he's already ministered to her and she's gone off to the city to, to share the truths that he shared with her, he tells them that I have a food that you don't know anything about. To do the will of my father. Fear of the Lord produces this type of hunger. It produces this, this type of purpose on the inside of us that, that helps us not to walk in lawlessness, but to walk in obedience. Hebrews 5, 7 says this, In the days of his flesh, speaking of Jesus, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. When you look at that in Hebrew, or excuse me, in the Greek, you find out that it means godly fear. Too often, we can get so comfortable with God that we make decisions on how to do life without even consulting him. And Ananias, as you read on in, in chapter five, and, five and, and you find him and, and his wife, they, they suffered tremendously because they didn't consult the Holy Spirit. They didn't consult God before they made a decision. 
should we give? What would you like for us to give, Father? But because they had drifted into this place of lawlessness, it was the approval of men that they really were after. There was this appearance, this appearance of holiness or, 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 or whatever it was that, that, that the enemy was able to tempt them with that to get the approval of these other men and women became more important than the approval of God. Do you, do you see the gravity of keeping the seatbelt of the fear of the Lord disconnected in your life can bring about? Fortunately, none of us are or just dropping dead in, in, in church services when we've, we've made a poor decision. But has there been a slow drift? Have you noticed that unlike Jesus whose prayers were answered because of his reverence, maybe your prayers aren't being answered? Maybe there's some godly knowledge that he wants to give to you, but because you haven't chosen the fear of the Lord, he's not giving you access to it. Maybe like some of us, maybe, or, or maybe there's many of us who don't even real, didn't even realize that there's some treasures that come along with the fear of the Lord. So we haven't even considered what we may be missing out on. But there are great benefits that come along with the fear of the Lord. Knowledge, the beginning of knowledge. It's the fear of the Lord. Goodness, the goodness of God is experienced for those who fear, fear the Lord. Multiplication of our church community was attributed in part to the fear of the Lord. Take you back to, to um, well, take you to Acts chapter 9, I think it's verse 2. Not two. Hey, can't find it. Verse 31. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. We want to win the city. This is a key ingredient. This is a key ingredient to us seeing the type of change that we want to see, that God has given us a vision of. It's found here in the fear of the Lord. I'll read it to you again. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. Not just added, it multiplied. So what do we need to do if we want to choose the whole, if we want to choose this, this holy seatbelt, so to speak? If we want to choose um, the fear of the Lord? I think the first thing is that we have to take some time to repent. First and foremost. I mean, if, if, you've, if you have a sense, not of condemnation, but of conviction, you know, Lord, I have not feared you. You need to take a moment to repent. We need to ask the Holy Spirit to forgive us. So in very unusual fashion, I just want to take a moment to do that. Because I believe that some of us are feeling this conviction. So if you don't mind, let's close our eyes and bow our heads. And though I'm going to pray, I pray that you will do business with God yourself. Because it's in this space of turning away from behavior that's not pleasing to him that we experience really the grace of God on our lives. Heavenly Father, it's been real easy to get to a space where we, we, we heard about the legalism, we heard about the um, fire or, and brimstone type of preaching, Lord God. 
and, and like Ananias, we, we, we moved away, but maybe we moved a little too far away, and now we're in a space where we don't really have a fear of you, though we love you. Father, forgive us for not choosing the fear of the Lord, not walking in it every day. We pray, Holy Spirit, as one of your manifestations, you said that you, you, you manifest yourself in a spirit of the fear of the Lord. My prayer, Lord God, is that you will begin to fill this room with your presence. The new sense of awe, like in Acts chapter 2, that came upon the people. Not because of anything a man did, but because of the work that you did. We avail ourselves to you now, Holy Spirit. Thank you for your conviction, Holy Spirit. Thank you for endeavoring to continue to shape us and mold us into the image of Christ. In the name of Jesus. Amen. So is that it? Is, is that all we need to do? No. <laughs> There's more. Psalms 34, 11 says, Come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. The reality is the fear of the Lord is not something you're just going to mentally ascend to. It's something that you, working with the Holy Spirit, will, it will come about, that he will teach you um, the fear of the Lord. There's a, a, um, a quote that, that we have. In, if, if you've never been to Life in the Spirit and you're a member, you still should come to Life in the Spirit. It's not just for that. There's some great things that are taught there. And one of the quotes that are... Um, that's, that, that we um, teach from is that, man, it just, just escaped my mind. Is um, <laughs> this idea that the Christian life can't be done by yourself. You can't. You can't stay in the space where you don't get into the ditch of lawlessness or you get into the ditch of, of, of legalism. You can't, you, I mean, it, it's, it's not, it, it's just not, it's, you, you're not able to do that on your own. We need the fear of the Lord. And the Holy Spirit in, in Psalms 34, 11 says that he will teach you. And so in, in Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, I, I wanted to put it, have him put it up there. Um, this, I believe, are some steps that are going to help you to be, if you begin to meditate on this and ask the Holy Spirit to guide you, um, and you begin to employ this into your life, then I think that there is, these are our steps trying to meet the Holy Spirit where we need to meet him so that the change can begin to occur in our heart. Verse 1 of Proverbs chapter 2 says, My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive. So not just reading your Bible, but being attentive to what God is saying in your Bible. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because we can go through the motions. We can check the box. We can just, you know, if you got the Bible, you version app, you know, the, the verse of the day. Hey, I, I read that. I'm good. <laughs> hey, you, you, keeping it all the way real. Making your ear attentive. You're going to make it attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding. See, there is wisdom and understanding that belong with the Lord. Then we want to be attentive to that. We don't want to just follow what conventional wisdom is in all the various areas that it may present itself. We want to submit ourselves humbly to the spirit of the fear of the Lord so that he can teach us wisdom and understanding. Inclining your heart to understanding. Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding. If you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures. You know, every Friday night, there's a prayer team that gets together over there in the classroom. Shameless plug, I'm over the prayer ministry. We call it prayer shield. But we seek the Lord's face together as a community and we cry out to him. And we spend time seeking it because we know his presence and his, him speaking to us is more valuable than silver and gold. If you can taste that, if you taste that, 
The fear of the Lord. You will begin to, to find the fear of the Lord. It, he's telling us that not only do we need to read our word and be attentive to what we're reading, but we need to cry out to God that we need to pray. If you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. That doesn't want to put you in a space where you're not able to walk holy for he is holy. He wants to help you. But it takes us kneeling down, humbling ourselves and saying, Holy Spirit, I need your help. That though there's something in me that fights against uh, me wanting to read this word because for some reason it just doesn't seem as exciting as the NBA playoffs or some type of sitcom or drama show. Man, I need this. I need this in my life. When we've getting, gotten to that space, the Holy Spirit begins to unravel begins to, to show you the fear of the Lord. It's not following a set of rules, though we have to be obedient. Don't, don't get it twisted. But having a fear of the Lord is something that's developed through the intimacy that you have with him. Being in his word, spending time in prayer. I believe that God is calling us as a community of believers to really begin to, to walk in this. And there are people who are in our communities who do not know him. They may come back with an argument when they hear the fear of the Lord. You know, 1 John 4 says that perfect love casts out fear. But the reality of what the, what, what the apostle was talking about was the fact that, man, if, if, you're not, if you're not right with God, there's impending doom coming. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's not a game. Just like Ananias realized this isn't a game, this is, is, is not a, a lot of words. My, my nephew understood. You got to put your seatbelt on. You have to put your seatbelt on. And whether Jesus comes back today or a thousand years from now, in the next 65, 80 years, you're going to go see him. And are you going to be ready for that? And there's a, there, there are people who are outside these walls who don't know that. And us walking in the fear of the Lord helps us to multiply, not for numbers' sake, but that there will be people who will be introduced to someone who actually knows God. So there's something on us that we need to, we need to bend our knee so that others aren't left out in the cold. Now, there may be some in, some in here, you know, when you were reading that scripture, it wasn't just a, a kind of confusion about it, but I actually do fear God. And the apostle was making very clear that if, if there's a fear of him, if there's the fear of punishment, it's probably because you're not right with him. It's because you haven't experienced the loving embrace of the Father. And so with every head bowed and eyes closed,